I'll be sharing with us on becoming a person of influence as I lay a foundation for the awesome messages that are coming in the course of this conference. I read a poem. The author is unknown, but I found it inspiring. It reads, my life shall touch a dozen lives before this day is done. Leave countless marks for good or ill, as sets the evening sun. This is the wish I always wish, the prayer I always pray. Lord, may my life help other lives it touches by the way. Influence is the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something, or the effect itself. Influence is the capacity to have effect, or the effect itself. Let's check other words that describe influence. The word affect. So when someone or something has the capacity to influence, it means that it has the capacity to affect. It has the capacity to have an impact on someone or something. Influence means that you can determine. You can determine, or you can decide, or you can control, or you can guide. Influence means that you can shape. Influence means that you can govern. So when I look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, in the Bible, and it says, and God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and by extension, all of mankind, and God blessed them, and said, be fruitful, and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, rule over it, and have dominion over the birds of the air, over the fish of the sea, and over every moving thing that moves on the earth. That's influence to me. You have influence if you can cause change. You have influence if you can alter the state of something. I sincerely believe that you have the God-given capacity to alter the states of people, places, and things. It's a God-given capacity to alter states, to alter the state of a person, alter the state of a place. It could be an organization, it could be a city, I mean a geographical location. And you have the capacity to alter the states of things. You have capacity to create. You have the capacity to innovate. You are literally a change agent. My prayer is that your family, your school, your organization, your nation, and your world will never remain the same just for the fact that you came to this world. Amen. Jesus described you as salt. He described you as light. He, describes, he described your capacity to cause change as your flavor. Because he said in Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its taste or its flavor or its saltiness, you have flavor. That thing that gives you the ability to alter the states of other people. Matthew 5.13 in the Message Bible reads, Let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. 
If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your use, use, usefulness and will end up in the garbage. It's amazing. That flavor that God has put in you is what brings out the God flavors on this earth. Something is lost if you refuse to release your flavor. But what strikes me most, I think, in that verse is if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Somebody said, if the food has no taste, I know what to do to it. <laughs> I will add salt to it. He said, but when salt has no taste, what do we do? <laughs> See, it is God that puts the saltiness in salt. And God himself is saying here, once that capacity is taken out of salt, there's nothing else that can be done. He said, it will be thrown out and out of frustration, people would trample it underfoot. So that's what happens. If you lose your capacity to affect, your capacity to influence, your capacity as a change agent, people lose their value for you. People value you to the degree to which you have value to add to them. I say that in our world, the poor man is not the one without money. He is the one that is not adding value. Because when you understand the way money works, money is only a means of exchange of value. So your relevance on this planet is in your flavor or in your saltiness. You hold the promise of positive change for others. And if you don't fulfill that promise, you can be ignored. I press the point that you have the capacity to affect other people. Because I believe that every human being is an extension of God. In fact, all of creation is an extension of God. Every little bit of creation is an extension of God. So you will find a part of God in every single one and every single thing that God created. I believe that there is a part of God in you. There is a part of God that is musical. And he's dropped that part in some people. You hear the voice, you hear the songs, or you hear the lyrics. Amazing. Or it's the ability to play an instrument. God has that. And he puts that flavor in some people. There's a part of God that is artistic. He puts that in other people. There's a part of God that is aesthetic. Beautiful. See, you, you, you read the Bible, you realize heaven is the most beautiful place ever described. Am I right? God loves aesthetics. Some people think the more ugly it is, the more spiritual it is. <laughs> I'm serious. They, they do not associate excellence with God. They do not associate beauty with God. But God is beautiful. Heaven is beautiful. And I, mean, I got jolted to value excellence uh, the day I was reading Deuteronomy 23 and Moses was speaking to Israel while they were in the desert. In verses 12 to 14, he said, you shall keep the camp holy for the Lord your God who comes to deliver you must not see an unclean thing. 
Okay? He was describing in verse 13 how if they wanted to pass out any waste, they should take their equipment, go outside the camp, dig the ground, do whatever they wanted to do, and cover the refuse. He said, for the Lord your God who comes to deliver. He said, lest the Lord your God who comes to deliver you see the unclean thing and turn away from you. I said, oh my God. Wow. A dirty environment can turn God away. Wow. Africa needs to hear that. (laughs) Because some of us can pray on a garbage heap. And Moses described that as holiness. Keep the camp holy. Amazing. So I realized we are a part of God's kingdom. Anyone that represents God's kingdom should reflect God's beauty and God's cleanliness. Amen? Amen. But then, you just find out some people are beautiful. I see some guys, I say, wow. You see some ladies, wow. Beautiful. It's a gift. It's the flavor. Some people are multi-millionaires today because they recognize the flavor, that their beauty is their flavor. I was at a shop, a gift shop, you know, some few years back here in Lagos. And as I was checking out what to buy, two of the ladies who worked in the shop were having a chat. And one was saying to the other about one of their colleagues that she's struggling too hard to look beautiful. She's struggling too hard to look beautiful. She doesn't know that beauty is a gift. You know what? The shop owner and myself just looked at each other. This was, (laughs) I mean, an attendant. Such profound wisdom. (laughs) I said, I love this lady. So she recognizes it. It's a gift. There's no point struggling. (laughs) It's a gift. Have you heard someone try to sing before who is not gifted for singing? (laughs) I'm telling you, some people sing, and I I, I have a feeling the Holy Spirit just goes on a straw. (laughs) When you're done, I'll come back. (laughs) There's a part of God that is scientific. There's technology in God. There's a part of God that is poetic. But what I'm trying to say is there isn't a single human being on this planet that does not have a part of God in him or her. And that part of God in you is what gives you the capacity to affect and to influence people, places, and things. My encouragement today is that you discover and celebrate your flavor. I pray that in the course of this conference, somebody will hear something. Someone will see something. Things that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard. Things that have never entered into the heart of any man before. I place this will be the place of revelation, the place of discovery of purpose the place of recovery of lost opportunities in the name of Jesus Christ. When I read from Paul the Apostle in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, he describes how he went to Jerusalem and how uh, the leadership of the church then had to recognize his flavor. He said, for he that walked in Peter, the apostleship to the circumcision, that is to the Jews, also worked in me effectively apostleship to the uncircumcised. It's amazing that Paul got his best results when he spoke to people who were not Jews. He was a Jew. Peter got his best results when he spoke to Jews. It happened on the day of Pentecost. It happened when this man who had been lame all his life was healed. 
in Acts chapter 5. It's amazing how it works, or in Acts chapter 3. So, Paul said, they recognized that we had our own, our different flavors. They recognized mine. I like it. Even though Paul had this passion for the Jews, when you read Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, I mean, he got to the point where he said he, he wished he could be cursed just so that Israel could be saved. Anywhere Paul went, he would look for a Jewish synagogue and preach there first, and they would beat him. <laughs> then he would go to his right customers. <laughs> I want to encourage someone here. They have beat you enough. You've experienced enough failure. You should have identified by now the things that are not working for you. Go to your right customers. <laughs> Recognize and celebrate your flavor. Whether you are conscious of it or not, you are influencing someone. So you need to be deliberate about the release of your flavor because whether you are conscious of it or not, it's affecting someone. <laughs> I had Dr. Mensah Otabil share uh, some years back how one day he was driving in Accra, Ghana, where he lives, and uh, there was heavy traffic on the way, and he was in a hurry. You know, I understand what he's talking about because I've been to Accra before a few times. Heavy traffic. So he said he was driving behind this taxi cab, and somewhere along the line, the taxi cab branched off the road, you know, and he thought to himself, these taxi drivers always know the back roads. So he turned after the taxi driver. And then the taxi driver got to a road junction and turned. He turned after the taxi driver. Every time the guy turned, he turned after him and turned and turned and turned and turned until the guy parked in front of his house. <laughs> <laughs> now, my focus is on the taxi driver. Now, whether you realize it or not, somebody somewhere, <laughs> is either copying you, <laughs> copying your behavior, or something? Okay, there's this other interesting one. It was President Calvin Coolidge in the United States, and he had a guest at the White House. And they were having breakfast. And, and the man wanted to comport himself well. So at the table, he was looking at the president. He saw the president, you know, pour his tea, he poured his. He was, he was just doing exactly what the president did. And then at the point, the president took the teapot and poured the tea on the saucer. <laughs> and president put some sugar and put some cream. So he too poured his tea in the saucer. <laughs> he wanted to be sure he was obeying the laws of etiquette. So he poured his tea <laughs> in the saucer, also put some sugar and put some cream. So he was waiting for what the president would do next. So eventually the president took the saucer and put it on the floor for his cats. <laughs> Someone is copying you somewhere. You have to be careful what you're doing. Whether you're conscious of it or not, you are influencing someone somewhere for good or for bad. If you want to be deliberate about how you influence, I'll encourage you to do this. Build relationships first. Because salt affects when it makes contact with the food. You have to make contact with people. 
You've got to relate with people. Proximity is the key to impact. So it's interesting that when they asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment, it was relationships he spoke about. Your relationship with God and your relationships with other people. So you want to influence people, you have to build relationships. To build relationships, you've got to be a loving human being. That's what Jesus said. You have to be someone who has capacity to love. Capacity to recognize the value in people. The God value in people. And to reflect that value. When you see God in a person, whatever God deserves is what the person deserves. So the proof of love is given. You want to add up to the measure of the person's reality, to, to measure up to the vision that you have of the person. Whatever God deserves, the person deserves. So you give. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he did what he gave. So you've got to be generous. If you want to influence people, be generous. The poor man does not have many friends. The rich man has many friends. The poor man does not have. Why? Because most of the time, what the poor man is focused on is what to get. But that's the challenge there. And the poor man can turn that around, I'm serious, when he cultivates capacity for generosity. Be a giver. Add value to people's lives. And if you're going to build relationships with people, you have to be a humble person. You read 1 Corinthians 13, you see that in the Bible. If you're loving, you will be humble. If you love someone, you recognize the God value in them, you won't be out to prove anything. You won't be out to prove your superiority to them. You won't be out to prove that you're better than they are. No, you will be out to prove to them that they are better than they think they are. Who wants to hang around someone who belittles them? Nobody. Who wants to hang around someone who despises them or someone who rejects them? Nobody. So to exact influence, that's the starting point. We've got to cultivate relationships. We've got to love people genuinely. And of course, the flip side of the coin for love is forgiving. So we have to be people that recognize people are not perfect. We are not perfect. People are not perfect. So we can draw on the power of the Holy Spirit to overlook people's faults, to overlook their mistakes, and to write off their emotional debts. Forgive. Who doesn't want to hang around someone who can overlook your mistakes, even though they know that you have faults? See? Who wants to hang around the person who will continue to remind you of your faults? Who will hold against you what you did over the last 15 years? When Jesus described love Peter had to ask him <laughs> because Jesus was talking about forgiveness and how it could hurt your relationship with God. And Peter said, you know what? We have to put some data to this thing. Forgiveness. So, so how many times should my brother offend me and I forgive him? Sh should we make it seven times? Jesus said, oh, you want to use figures? Let me stretch it for you. Seventy times seven. So we've got to build relationships if we are going to influence people. Secondly, salt preserves. Salt preserves. Salt prevents corruption or decay. You need to have impact on the quality of people's lives. And the key word I would encourage there is mentoring. Mentoring. Now beyond just 
being good to people, you now need to deliberately help people to succeed. You want to maximize your influence with other people, help them to succeed. Provide guidance for them. Coach them. Teach them how to do it. I'm telling you, at this stage, you are multiplying your influence. I have enjoyed the benefit of mentoring. And I'll tell you, it's preservation of destiny. Mentoring delivers you from mistakes. Delivers you from mistakes, delivers you from your ignorance. <laughs> Sometimes, when I, when I remember uh, some of the conversations that I've had with uh, one of our speakers today, Dr. David Edipo, I, I laugh all by myself. And I'm just grateful that I was not left to myself. I'll give you an example. Um, one day, our church was still very young, and we were searching for a, a property to move into. So we, we found one. We had not paid yet. We found one when, we, when I went to him and told him, oh, we found a place. And um, uh, we're about to pay for it. And in fact, as soon as we move in there, we have some strategies. I have some strategies that we're going to execute for growth. He said, fine. Like what? I said, as soon as we move in, the first thing we're going to do is to do 21 days prayer and fasting. He said, good. He said, but wait a minute. What's the longest fast that you and the church members have gone on as a church? I said, well, seven days. Seven days. I've led them on prayer and fasting for seven days. He said, good. How far is this new place from where you are? <laughs> Will people have to take commercial transportation, maybe get on the bus before they get there? I said, yes. I said, okay. So the likelihood is that some people around where you are now may not be able to go with you if they're unable to pay because it will cost them money now. I said, yes. I said, okay. He said, what, what would you say has been the major attraction for your church up until now? I said, it's the word. It's the teaching, sir. I said, good. He said, so um, when you move into that new place, uh, you'll be trying to get some of your old members to come along with you, and you'll be trying to get some new people from the new environment to join you. I said, yes. He said, if I were you, what I would do for 21 days would be what has been the major attraction of the church. I said to, he said to add 21 days prayer and fasting on the inconvenience, or, or with the inconvenience <laughs> of coming to your new location. I'm not sure if that's going to be a, a fantastic strategy. You know what, as he was saying that, I was smiling. I didn't tell him what I was thinking. I was thinking to myself, why was I thinking like that? <laughs> so how, what made me think that the major attraction from the church will be putting people on hunger strike. <laughs> and what he said just makes sense. <laughs> so you don't know. You may not think that you have achieved much, but sincerely speaking, there are a few things you've learned to do well that for some other people are a huge struggle. You are the one who is undervaluing or underestimating what you know how to do. I mean, you're a guy, you know how to tie your shoelace, you know, within a few seconds. There are still some people struggling with learning. They may even be teenagers, how to tie a shoelace or how to not a tie. Wherever you think you are, you are a potential mentor to someone. And you can exert that influence if you will choose to provide guidance, mentoring, encouragement.
to somebody somewhere. You can preserve somebody's destiny by releasing your flavor through mentoring. Let me touch on one more thing about salt. Scientists have helped us to realize now that to form salt, you need the combination of sodium and chlorine. Am I right? And they help us to understand that one of them is positively charged, the other one is negatively charged. The one that is negatively charged simply has an extra electron. Am I right? The one that is positively charged lacks one electron. So the one that has the extra electron actually gives it to the one that lacks the electron and in the process, the sodium and the chlorine come together to form something that either of them could never have become on their own. Because one of them was willing to sacrifice the extra electron. To sacrifice the extra electron. You see what happens? This is, this is my point. You will never realize your potential to affect or influence other people until you break free from self-centeredness. The people who function at the highest level of influence, when you research into them, you realize they have capacity for sacrifice. We had an interesting experience here in this church. The first three years, the church, in terms of growth, was crawling. And I was wondering, what is it? And eventually, one day, I was praying. I knew it was time. God wanted to do something. And I was praying. Lord, you've got to make this church grow. Because I've read in the Bible, and the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. So you're the one that brings people to a church. Why are you not bringing people? And he asked me a question. You've heard me say it before for those of us who've been here. He asked me a question. Why do you want the church to grow? And I thought, wow. I thought God wanted the church to grow. <laughs> he said, why do you want the church to grow? But, you know, instantly I, I realized, hmm, there's something coming here. Because God, when God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Usually it's because he wants to confront you with your foolishness. And I sensed that was coming for me, okay? So I, I kept silent. And the Holy Spirit said to me, I know why you want the church to, that church to grow. Because you want to be more comfortable. You want to be more comfortable. It was true. <laughs> as long as the church was small in size, couldn't pay me a good salary, couldn't cover my bills, this church needed to grow. <laughs> The man of God needed breakthrough. <laughs> okay? So, I, so God was <laughs> right on the spot. So I said, so, so he said, you will never find the definition of success for your ministry until you help those people that I sent to you to succeed. It was an amazing deliverance for me took the attention off of myself because my focus was, was on how to be a successful minister, how to succeed in ministry. That was the focus. I, I understand for many pastors, if you've experienced deprivation before, the kind that we experience in this part of the world, <laughs> suffering is not sweet. <laughs> in fact, you remember the song? Some of us know the song here. It said, suffering is not stew. It was a very, very famous song. Yeah. <laughs> Suffering is not stew. <laughs> it's not soup. <laughs> you want to get out of it as fast as you can. You want to get out of deprivation as fast as you can. So when we get into ministry, that's part of the motivation for everything. And God saw through all that. And he confronted me. Once I took the attention from off of myself and focused on, focused on people, the dynamics changed. Completely. Absolutely. Then I could focus just on adding value. To other people, the one thing our church members don't doubt is the fact that if I get anything that is useful for them, I'll give it to them. 
Amen. So it's sacrifice that makes relationships possible and takes them to the highest level of influence. It's the fact that my wife and I can sacrifice, come together, work together, that makes it possible for us to bat things, bat kids, <laughs> that either of us could never, or neither of us could never have produced on our own. Makes it possible for us to bat visions and dreams and projects and organizations. It's the same thing for us. And especially for us in our part of the world, I must say, having so many people in this room, in the overflow, watching on the internet today, tells us there's hope for Africa and for our world. Amen. Amen. But we must understand that it will not happen when each of us operates as an island, refusing to cooperate with other people, refusing to sacrifice to make that happen. Christ gave up who he was, so his followers could become whom they could never be on their own. John chapter 12, verse 24, he said, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains the way it is. But if it dies, it does what? It brings forth much fruit. I pray that in the course of this conference, God will take you to the much fruit dimension of your life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. To influence people positively, you must develop character and competence. You must develop character and you must develop competence. I love this story in Judges chapter 9. Jotam, you know, was given this parable about trees, how the trees got together and wanted to appoint a leader. They approached the olive tree. The olive tree, why sh- the olive tree said, why should I leave the production of oil? that brings honor to both God and men, just so I can exercise leadership over all the trees. They approached the fig tree. Fig tree said, why should I leave the production of my sweet fruit? Just to lord it over all the trees. They came to the vine. The vine said, why should I leave the production of my wine that brings joy? to men, just to exercise lordship over the trees. Then they came to the bramble. The bramble is a shrub. They said, bramble, come and be king over us. The bramble said, if you want me to be king over you, all of you have to come and hide under my shade. He was saying that to the olive tree, Taller trees, bigger trees. See, I know I'm small, but I won't feel comfortable being your leader as long as you are taller than I am. So we will have to reduce your size. (laughs) He said, if you guys would not submit to my leadership, let fire come out of the bramble and consume all of you. (laughs) When I read the story, I said, no wonder God kept it small. Just imagine what it would do if it was bigger than that. So that's your understanding of leadership, right? That, it's fire that you have to give to consume other people. You know what I love about the other trees? They said they were not going to leave their opportunity to add value just to occupy a position. Remember, as I close this down, Your value, your influence is in your unique flavor. If you occupy a position without having value to give that would cause positive change, you are only wasting space. The key to influence is service. But you notice something about the olive, about the fig tree, about the vine. They are usually processed. The olive fruit is crushed for you to get the oil. The vine is also crushed for you to get the wine. So people may not enjoy your flavor in its raw state. You need to develop character. 
you need to develop competence. I read the story of the rich man and Lazarus in the Bible. I see the rich man pleading with Abraham, send Lazarus to go talk to my brothers. I don't want them to come here. Abraham says, no, it can't happen. He says, okay, send someone at least. Abraham says, no. He says, someone needs to go warn my brothers. And it occurs to me. One of the greatest regrets that people will have after their time on this planet will be what they did or did not do with their influence over other people. He had influence over his brothers, but he squandered that influence. You can influence people also for evil. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that your opportunity for influence will not be squandered. I pray that as we go through this conference, the power of the Holy Spirit will rest on you. And God will use every session to bring out your flavor, to anoint that flavor, and to send you forth to be a world-class change agent in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you once again for coming to ELC 2016, and God bless you in Jesus' name.